Today on the Topic Show, Daily Wire vs. Lowry Crowder 2.0, Hobart won't choke Bart anymore after the Simpsons cancel themselves yet again, Vivek reveals a no to Neocons pledge, Ron DeSantis gets the Iowa governor's endorsement but is still roasted online, Rivian Q3 results are in and sales are up, well, Lucid Q3 results are in and they are down, and GM temporarily puts the brakes on their driverless vehicle. All of that and much more on the Topping Show. Thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller service company with a special preference in IT security. Heck, I see their founder released twice today. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, you see, that's a joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, trying to get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of November. So if you could click that button, I'd greatly appreciate it. Now, going over to the business part of the podcast, you have Rivian. Q3 results are in, and revenue is up 143% year over year to racking it up to $1.32 billion. Now, this thanks comes to us thanks to rather Yahoo Finance and actually helped their stock boost a little bit by a mere 3% at the news of this. In regards to a production standpoint, they said that Rivian increased their full year forecast to 54,000 vehicles from 52,000 vehicles. Its prior forecast was 52,000 units was lifted earlier in the year from 50,000. And when asked for comment, they said, quote, due to the progress experienced on our production lines, the ramp up of our in-house motor line and the supply chain outlook, we are increasing our 2023 production guidance to 54,000 units, unquote. And that was in the Q3 shareholders newsletter. Now, Rivian also narrowed its full year adjusted earnings before income tax deductible EB EBITDA lost to $4 billion from $4.2 billion and revealed that its 2023 CapEx guidance was reduced to $1.1 billion. Now, they continue to say that Rivian is no longer subject to the exclusivity selling its electric ve- delivery vehicle van to Amazon, which is one of the important shareholders for Rivian. Though they just Rivian did say that they still plan to build about 100,000 delivery vans for Amazon, which is quite a few vans per their earlier agreement. Now, Amazon waiving off the exclusivity clause creates a, quote, a key upside potential to unlock EDV vans from only being 20 to 35,000 deliveries per year to its 60 plus K capacity per year. So it'll be interesting to see how many companies want to have the same exact delivery van that Amazon has. I am I almost wonder if that was a sunset clause of the contract or if that is something where Amazon let them off the hook. But I think a lot of people might contribute that to be a competitive advantage for Amazon since for short-term delivery, as long as you don't care about the you know the long-term ROI in terms of you know the vehicle lasting over 100,000 miles, an EV delivery van might make sense. So It'll be interesting to see if the competitors, if you have something like FedEx or UPS for deliveries, if they start to tap Rivian on the shoulder and say, hey, why don't we just buy our trucks from you? Or trucks, I say trucks, I really mean vans. Now, in terms of the fiscals, for the quarter, Rivian posted a revenue of $1.34 billion versus the $1.31 expected, while the adjusted loss per share is at $1.19 versus the $1.32 expected. They know that the revenue figure represents a 19.6% jump from Q2's $1.12 billion and 150% more than the or $536 million reported a year ago. On an adjusted EBITDA basis, Rivian reported a loss of $942 million versus the $1.04 expected billion, which also narrower than the $1.3 billion loss a year ago. So slowly but surely, it looks as if the company is starting to get to the point in which they will eventually get to a profitability point, which again, in terms of EVs and productions, it's the volume. You just have to get it up to the volume, get the price point down for the components when you buy things in bulk. There are a lot of factors that'll help them get to that profitability point. And even though the US adoption rate of EVs is decreasing, it'll be interesting to see if Rivian is able to get to that profitability point or what the consumers are starting to drift towards. They kind of, they, they were certainly the first big company to market in terms of a EV truck that people could buy. That really put Rivian on the map for a lot of folks. 
And then subsequently, yeah, the Ford F-150 Lightning and the 18 people who bought that were surely happy for the day they used it before they tried to tow something. They were, of course, subsequently disappointed. And then, I mean, GM will come out with the Chevy Silverado EV someday, sometime. So it'll be interesting to see, I mean, what's the remainder of the market share? And then, of course, the Cybertruck will come out sometime, eventually, in theory. So it'll be interesting to see, of the remaining people who want an EV truck, how many of them really are there left in the market? I mean, especially for trucks, I'm always a little bit more skeptical for the EV adoption. I mean, trucks are like sports ball teams. M majority of the time, uh, every time I'm talking to someone, why do they choose the brand truck they have with the drive, with the con engine configuration, what have you? And more often than not, it's just because their dad had the same brand, their grandpa had the same brand. It's a huge part of the personality. It is a huge enthusiasm around the brand. It has a huge cult following. So it'll be interesting to see how many of those legacy truck fans and how many of the real, how many of the truck buyers will adopt the EVs. It'll be interesting to see. Let me in the comments. Would you ever buy an EV truck? And if so, why? Uh, you certainly don't tow anything more than perhaps I'm trying to think a bale of. Packing peanuts, perhaps, would be a good use case in which you could actually tow something with an EV truck for a long distance. It'd be interesting, but let me know in the comments, what's your use case of why you would buy one? Other interesting business news, you have Lucid. Q3 results are in, and revenue is down about 30%. Now, Lucid, if you're not a big, uh, I was going to say, Gearhead is really more of a traditional petrol head. It's someone who's really passionate about automotives. Ideally, they enjoy having experience with three pedals, also known as manual transmission, as every car should have by default. Now, Lucid, I don't know, what, I guess maybe if you're not an EV enthusiast, I'm trying to think if you would know about Lucid. Nevertheless, they were a luxury EV manufacturer. Their cars range, I believe, anywhere between about 95,000 and 249,000. And their marketing is so bad, well, I should say their design, in my opinion, they all look the same. Is part of the reason I think that the Chevy SS was such a commercial failure. As much as I love the Chevy SS, it was an import from Australia. It was the Holden SS, but they rebashed it Chevy SS. They really didn't give it a model name, which is kind of the detriment to that. But it was great. That vehicle had a stick shift and V8. I mean, that was awesome. But the advertising, the Chevy SS looks so similar, unless you're an enthusiast, to like the Chevy Malibu, and they put no marketing behind it. I think one of the reasons Lucid's adoption rate is not as great as Tesla's, well, one, the price point is even more expensive, but the differences between the lower end Lucid Air, I believe it's called, and the Sapphire is the, I think that's their top, top of the line option. They look so similar, unless you're like a really passionate about that and you can spot out the little nuances, little differences. I'm just skeptical to know how many people would go for that really, really, really expensive option. And again, it's for a disposable toy. I say that because, again, with technology, there very well might be a new EV battery technology tomorrow since technology does move quick. With the current lithium-ion technology we have now, it's basically a glorified smartphone, which, again, is basically disposable. Also, only one company can work on that product, so your mom-and-pop dealer down the street or your mom-and-pop mechanic can't work on your vehicle. It's like a smartphone, just as it's disposable, and I would also argue worse for the environment. Perhaps another topic for another time for that analysis, however. Now, specifically getting to the numbers, this thanks to Yahoo Finance, which we very well might be giving Yahoo more shout outs in the past two weeks than most people have in the past 20 years. If you're an old soul like me, you remember what Yahoo used to be. The OG search engine, as some might say. Now, getting to the fiscals, Lucid reported key three revenue of 137.8 million and they attributed that to the customer deliveries of 1,457 vehicles in the quarter. Which, again, that's, in terms of commercial volume, that's nothing. That's compared to the traditional automotive companies like Tesla, Volkswagen, General Motors. Like, that's basically a rounding error. But, again, they're still relatively new. They're building up capacity. They're also building a new factory. Now, they also noted that the production of the Lucid Air Pure rear-wheel drive began in September and is in the process of ramping up. Production of the Lucid Air Sapphire... Also began in September, thus completing the Lucid Air lineup. Which again, they all all the trim levels, all they all look so familiar. They're all so close. Now, they also completed the general assembly production, shifted to phase two of Lucid's factory in Arizona. They also opened their first manufacturing plant in Saudi Arabia. Which, again, one of the reasons, and I do not 
I don't give financial advice. I always say the best advice you can give financially is to gamble on yourself, start a business. But nevertheless, one of the reasons I suspect Lucid is a more stable company than their stock represents is because Saudi Arabia just keeps throwing money at them. And Saudi Arabia, in terms of their economy, where they're trying to change the country, they really want to become more of a technology company or technology country. And they want to be seen as more innovative. They want to invest heavily in technology. And Saudi Arabia, they're known for oil production. That's why they're so massively wealthy. And they are throwing a lot of money at this company. They're one of the largest investors, in fact. So when you have someone who cares about that business, who has relatively unlimited money in terms of an oil based country, it's interesting to see how much, I suspect the company will be okay regardless of finances for quite some time. Now, they also know that they closed their Aston Martin transaction and commenced the strategic technology arrangement. Lucid also appointed Mark Winteroff as his first ever chief operating officer, overseeing the daily operations and execution across global manufacturing, supply chain, sales of service, re revenue, marketing, international markets. Now, Lucid Gravity, the company that's going to be their all-new electric SUV, will be unveiled on November 16th at the LA Auto Show with the start of production of that on track for late 2024. So it'll be interesting to see how do they differentiate that from the Tesla crossover SUV, whatever you want to call it, a little thing. I would suspect it's going to be slightly different styling and much, much, or maybe well, a much more expensive price point. So it'll be interesting to see how many people gravitate to a Lucid SUV. Now, in terms of the production outlook, they claimed for 2023, it revised it to 8,000 to 8,500 from the prior guidance of more than 10,000 to prudently align with deliveries. So now their goal is about 8,000 to 8,500. 8, It'll be interesting to see how that works out. Let me know in the comments, Are you? do you think things will get better for Lucid? I mean, their stock is precipitously, it's kind of a bargain buy, some might say. Because even as I look it up right now, sub four dollars per share market cap of nine billion dollars the 52 week low is yeah quite recently it's three three dollars and 95 cents it's 398 today oh as of this recording granted it fluctuates the stock market quite much and i mean what's the year to date so the max stock they're ipo'd at nine dollars 89 cents per share so that means they've lost 59.81 percent of their stock value to in total so that's stocks taking a beating so it'll be interesting to see and it looks like in terms of how much they lost per ev someone a website by the name of inside evs say that they lost four hundred thirty thousand dollars per ev sold which that's Better than last quarter, last fiscal quarter, they apparently lost $544,000 per vehicle sold. So again, very similar to Rivian, every quarter that loss is decreasing, or rather it's getting lesser and lesser. So it'll be interesting to see again, when do they get to that point in which they become profitable? That's really the long-term elephant to the room, so to say. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, I would never buy one personally just because, you know, they only have two pedals, which to me, what's the difference between that and just sleeping? I'm one of those old fo old souls that actually prefer having a manual transmission, also known as three pedals, a little stick shift, as every car should have by default. But nevertheless, let me know in the comments. Would you ever buy a Lucid? And if so, would you spend money to get the Lucid Sapphire Banana Falcon, whatever they call the top line one, which is $249,000 before tax title registrations? Let me know. I'll be fascinated to hear what you have to say. Now, going over to the culture part of the podcast, you have Daily Wire vs. Lowry Crowder 2.0. And Jeremy Boring gets 1.6 million views on the Twitter. Now, they are two of the perhaps most prominent, well-known conservative media companies, bar none. I mean, Fox News is they're probably as relevant as well, something that's utterly irrelevant these days. It's cassette tapes. I mean, sure, I know perhaps two people who still coveted their, set, their little cassette tapes, but most people haven't even thought about it in years. Fox News is pretty much the cassette tape. Yeah, the metaphor does stand. I'll go with that. Now, the Daily Wire is one of the fastest growing conservative media companies. They're headquartered over in Nashville, Tennessee. And then you have Larry Crowder, also one of the fastest growing media companies, conservative based, and they are headquartered over in Texas. Now, Larry Crowder, 
while they're smaller in headcount, they're having one of the most biggest impacts on the culture war, many are saying. They actually broke the biggest story of the year, I would argue, and I think many people will, when it came out that the Trans Shooters Manifesto, which had been suppressed for months, Larry Crowder broke that story, which broke the internet. I mean, it was trending on Twitter, everyone was talking about it, and it turns out, interestingly enough, the one time the manifesto from all these incidents was suppressed was because it was going against the mainstream media narrative. This person was, according to the documents that were revealed, venomously against the white race, had a lot of hate in their heart, they used a lot of pejorative terms that are not used in polite conversations, so to say. It turns out this person was the most morally and mentally vacuous people on the planet. And Steven Crowder broke that story because of his team. Now, Jeremy Boring, historically, there's a conversation between two companies where the Daily Wire made an offer letter to Larry Crowder. And they didn't work out those differences, so they decided to part ways. And there's a big controversy. It basically split the whole conservative community. And people decided to take sides and say one was right, one was wrong. And in doing so, it kind of bit... That's a nice way of saying it, put a dent in the culture war, put a kind of put the brakes on the movement for some people in that regard, or put a screwdriver in the spokes of the wheel, perhaps is a better metaphor. It split the community, people having to choose sides, and really lost a lot of momentum, I believe. Now, Jeremy Boring had this tweet, and within a day, he got 1.6 million views. Without further ado, again, Jeremy Boring is the CEO of the Daily Wire. So without further ado, this is what Jerry Boring said. He says, quote, Crowder is dishonest, spiteful, narcissistic scumbag who even in his victories can't help but betray most everyone else doing good work in our space, including those who have sued for the release of this manifesto like the Tennessee Star. As someone who not sufficiently pure or dedicated to or conservative, his quote, no true Scotsman quote, shtick is offensive and tired but credit where it's due, he landed a huge and important scoop here. And interesting enough, so Jeremy is responding to an article from the Daily Wire where they are referencing the Nashville shooter decried, I guess, I don't know, crackers and white privilege in the leaked manifesto. And it's one of those things that are very out of, kind of out of character when you look at Jeremy Boring's long-term track in terms of social media. He's doesn't make a lot of direct jabs like that. Now, interestingly enough, and go to the comments, and again, the conservative movement was kind of split 50-50, or more or less, I feel, and a lot of people will say Crowder is much more conservative than the Daily Wire, and is he does much less compromising. So there are many people who feel he's a lot more authentic. Now, in regards to the feedback, I'll go ahead and I'll dive in right there in the comments section. So again, that got, where is it here? I got 5.9 thousand likes from Jerry Boring's statement out of 1.6 million views. One of the first top comments comes from John Masters, and he says, quote, Unless Crowder included some dig against the Daily Wire in his reporting, I don't grasp the point of this dis uh, discretion, unquote. I got 2,000 likes out of 105,000 views. Now, Jeremy Boring did directly respond to this individual, and Jeremy Boring said, quote, He did, he always does, unquote. That got 1.1 thousand likes, 156,000 views. Nate Spinney responded saying, is Crowder in the room right now, unquote, getting 148 likes. Now, unfortunately, I don't see the exact, if that was done, I don't see the expert for, excerpt uh, that Jeremy Boring is referring to. But can you go down, continuing to go down here, rather, you have someone from the name of Savannah Hernandez. Now she says, quote, this is the pettiest thing I've ever read in my life. Our own FBI suppressed how white American children were targeted and murdered. Crowder got the scoop. The nation got clarity. And you choose to rehash some old beef that no one had, was even thinking about. Unquote, sad. Unquote. That got 8,000 likes. Which, as the youth might say, that is certainly a ratio. Now, interestingly enough, no one responded to that direct comment that she made. Someone by the name of B. Scalia said, quote, This post kind of paints you as many of the insults you listed should have said, I don't like Crowder, but this story is important, unquote. And this person got 825 likes, unquote. Jake Shields responds saying, quote, 
you could have just retweeted the article on Quote King 713 likes. Looks like getting a couple more in the middle in terms of people supporting versus going against Jeremy in the comments. Someone by the name of the lectern guy says, quote, I don't like it when mommy and daddy fight, unquote, getting 161 likes. Which I think reflects a lot of the sentiment around this cultural situation where you have these two successful media companies that are doing a lot of good. I mean, a lot of people are attributing the Daily Wire, they're part of Bent Key Ventures, and that's their new app and media outlet for children's material which is going to be less politically slanted. And that's one of the big issues I think in culture today is most of that stuff, AKA Disney is highly political in one direction. So they like many companies are creating their own competition and Crowder is breaking some of the biggest stories out there. So again, it's interesting to see, I think there's a lot of people who want to support both companies, but they feel like they're being pushed to choose one or the other. I can't help but think that's, there's a big sentiment of folks in the middle. Now, nevertheless, going over to the comments, some by the name of Second Hand Vegan said, quote, I take it you're one of the people he stated goes to dinner parties with Google, YouTube execs, and Mark Zuckerberg, unquote, getting 620 likes, which Steven Crowder has pointed that out because the Daily Wire has. The Daily Wire, like many companies, they spend millions of dollars promoting their talent on those platforms, thereby supporting the platforms that, ironically, are also suppressing them. So it's one of those issues where it is a not a direct monopoly, but for social media, there are less than a handful if you kind of count them off. And there is a pay to play in terms of you can pay so that your post is promoted and more people see it. And I believe Ben Shapiro is like six or seven years ago, it, it was leaked or it came out that he got, apparently he got a meal with Mark Zuckerberg, which I think, of course, Mark probably leaves more left on many of his issues, but Mark used to be very staunch or very adamant about preserving the First Amendment and giving free speech and making it an open platform. I think the issue in that regard is that a lot of the managers he hired, a lot of people he hired, didn't so much believe in that sentiment, which again is one of the issues when growing a company, when you have, you're hiring leadership and you're hiring middle managers, they're starting to do things their own way that go against your company's values or what the values that you are trying to do embolden and inspire. So it'll be interesting to see, I believe, Jeremy also did call the CEO of Google to actually, in an attempt to not negotiate, but to plead with them not to demonetize louder, demonetize rather louder with Crowder. Because again, not only is Google creating their own competition, AKA Rumble, which I also posted a show on, but it's one of those issues where it's not good for society, society in my belief. Again, I'm not a doctor, but if you click the subscribe button, it may fix my stuttering. It's not a guarantee, I'm just saying it can't hurt. Why not try it out? Now. In terms of the Google demonetizing Steven Crowder, he is one of the largest conservative YouTubers ever. And by silencing him, you're shutting down the conversation. And again, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think the best conversations is when you allow all sides to speak their opinions, let it be known, and then have that debate and let the best ideals run to the surface. But nevertheless, I'll get back to the comments. Someone by the name of Lifting Libertarian, which A plus for marketing, pictures of someone lifting. Straight to the point. This person says, quote, Jesus, my guy, stop fighting each other, let it go, unquote. Getting 948 likes. Someone by the name of Taylor Henson saying, quote, what a petty and frankly R word post, unquote. The R word is someone who is mentally disabled. I So they said the actual word. I chose not to. And this person got 1.5 thousand likes. Let's see here. Jeff in Florida says, quote, this is so childish. This type of discord contributed to not renewing my DW subscription. What happened to the age old saying, if you don't have something to say, nice to say, dot, 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 unquote. Person got 272 likes. Let's see here. James Fishback says, quote, let it go. This is huge. Break bread and pray for the families lost in the hate crime, unquote. Getting 354 likes. Someone by name of Salty Cracker, which, again, A-plus marketing is a cartoon of a cracker with some salt on it. Although it has hands, and crackers don't have hands in the food section of the store, the crackers might be quite horrifying if they did. So a little deceptive advertising, but... 
I'll allow it. This person simply says, dumb, getting 678 likes. Let's see here. Tim the Tool Man says, quote, what an odd way to say thank you. Hope this article you wrote about our leak gets you all the clicks of those website sponsors. We just sell mugs, unquote. Getting 874 likes. Let's see. Hope this article you wrote about our leak. Oh, interesting enough. So his handle is Toolman Tim LWC. I'm saying sponge, we just sell mugs. And that is also a different methodology. So he's talking about selling mugs in regards to you know, the sponsors. And the Daily Wire, their business model is built on using a myriad of sponsors. If you watch your show, they have multiple ad breaks for the show. Now, Lila Crowder, they're much more selective instead of you could argue it's kind of the business methodology of quantity versus quality. Now, a lot of the Crowder, they might only have one sponsor, but they make extremely creative advertisements. I mean, some of the most creative advertisements you've seen or I've seen is when they do an advertisement. I believe one is my favorite one is when they made up for a building bar company or a protein bar company. And it was almost as it was a, it was a whole production, which again, there's a big risk to that in terms of there's a high cost associated that with that. But, I think it's very memorable, and I think those advertisements are very effective because of that. You're going to remember it, and it's going to be much more effective than a simple traditional ad read. Though this is also sponsored by Topping Technologies. I'll probably do some creative ads maybe in 2024 about that. But nevertheless, when you say about mugs, one of the biggest upsides and one of the biggest, most important things about Steven Crowder and his business is Mug Club. He literally built the business by having a subscription service around selling the mugs. It's become iconic and the story broke and they were able to release the story because one of the club members was able to get access to the manifesto data so not only is he building a business but he's building a whole community of allowing more information to be out there so that is a huge that's a very important point in differences between the businesses and my three cents i think one of the reasons why you didn't see a merger or a business agreement with between two companies is that they had a lot of business, different business ideals, the different business philosophies that were kind of contradictory. One wants to have five or seven ad reads for a video. One just wants to have one for a video. It's, there, I think there's a lot of cultural differences that led to the end result of not having that merger or not merger, rather the business relationship. Now let's go back to the comment section and get a couple more in here. Dude staff EDMEE -E says, quote, the hell, dude? Delete this and try again. Unquote. Getting 573 likes. Someone by the name of ne C simply says unnecessary. Unquote. Getting 574 likes. JD Sharp says, quote, why are you trying to distract them and downplay a blatant anti-white hate crime? Unquote. 745 likes. Rip Rhinus says, quote, I would point out you just did the very thing you accused him of doing. Unquote. Getting 590 likes. Ralph Munoz says, quote, but credit where credit is due. Jesus Christ, are little kids managing these companies now? Just say the last sentence. He landed a huge important scoop. Be a man, unquote. I got 760 likes. Spitfire says, quote, you are so juvenile and behaving like a scorned woman, unquote. Got 1,000 likes. I'm trying to see if there's one of the other topic comments here. Rocco Luciente says, quote, he's such a bad guy, but you have thrown seven insults at him before crediting him with breaking a massive and consequential story. This just makes you look bad, unquote, getting 473 likes. Tyler says, quote, you just can't admit Crowder was right about YouTube, unquote, getting 135 likes. Which, yes, I think Crowder was spot on with the YouTube being biased as all hell. They literally not just demonetized his channel for speaking the truth, but in this case, after Crowder released this groundbreaking story that none of the traditional legacy media outlets are touching with a 10-foot pole, quite the opposite. The seven says all the major media outlets are ignoring it, and they actually have the mainstream social media companies completely censoring it. So YouTube is now censoring that content, which furthers the point of why you need to build third-party platforms and different platforms such as Rumble, which you can also find this show on as well. Let's see. 
Facts over feelings, says, quote, Mug Club and LWC is some of the best political news and entertainment media around. Been watching LWC way before it was picked up by The Blaze TV. Now that he is on his own, I re would recommend subscribing, end quote. Getting 113 likes. And I'm scrolling hard to try to see if there's more supportive comments for this particular tweet from Jeremy. Uh, do one or two more. Garrett Henson says, quote, I'm a Daily Wire Plus subscriber, but this post reads like you're very, you're still upset you couldn't get your deal done to get Crowder at the Daily Wire. Move on and just give credit where credit is due. Got 101 likes. 101. Let's see here. Hugh the Libertine says, quote, I just watched it and I didn't see any of this, unquote, getting 105 likes, which... I believe this person is referencing the point at which Jeremy is claiming that Crowder uh, took a jab at the Daily Wire, apparently. I, yeah, I'm trying to find if there's... Mm. I'm scrolling hard, folks. There are lots of comments. Yeah, I I think Jeremy just got ratioed on this completely. I I'm not seeing a lot of positive. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, Yeah, pretty much everyone in the comments, I'd say 97% of these. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'd say 98% of these comments are all against Jeremy and or directly applauding Steven Crowder for breaking the story. So again, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, the, I know they're both men of faith and I'd hope I don't know, someday, it's kind of cliche to say bury the axe, but again, both organizations, both companies are making huge positive impacts in the culture war and the media war where we do need more media alternatives. The traditional ones aren't doing their jobs. Lord knows CNN's never going to break a story like this. It's, I think it's one of those issues where Jeremy was certainly ratioed, as the youth might say. It'll be interesting to see, at the end of the day, when do they shake, when do they shake hands and kind of get back to things as usual? I don't know if that'll ever happen, but in terms of making the dent in the universe, I mean, Crowder just broke the story of the century. It'll be interesting to see, it is a phenomenon where the more try to suppress data or censor something, the more it moves around. So I can't help but think this Nashville, unfortunately the incident with the Nashville shooter, I can't help but think this is just YouTube and all these social media companies trying to suppress the story. It starts gonna add fire, or rather add water to the oil fire, which is interesting enough, that's how the fire goes even greater and becomes stronger. So let me know in the comments, do you think because of how much censorship is being put on the specific manifesto, Will it have the opposite effect and actually make it even more talked about at the water cooler at work? Will it actually spread people to have more of an incentive to talk more about it? It'd be fascinating here, but as I always say, time shall tell. Other interesting cultural news, you have Homer won't choke Bart anymore as the Simpsons are canceling themselves yet again. Now this thanks this is coming to us thanks to Fox 11 Los Angeles, which I was going to say this, this might be the first time I referenced Fox in years. Nevertheless, they still have five employees, and I'm sure three of them are quite apt and good at their jobs. Now, one of the most well-known best gags in cartoon history is perhaps Homer, which, again, tr cliche, traditional Hollywood, you have the dad be a moronic buffoon, which, it's so it's so boring, it's done, it's, it's, again, just Hollywood just being a copy-paste, not coming up with their original idea. And I also argue they do that to try to make the nuclear family look as unattractive and make it not like it look like a good thing to do. But nevertheless, one of the longest gags of the show would be Bart doing something stupid or getting in trouble and Homer choking Bart. I mean, it was hilarious for decades because people realized it's a cartoon. It's not real life. It's a joke. But nevertheless, The Simpsons have a track record and Matt Groening is very much politically speaking, much more on the left. That's why people like me used to love Futurama, but then with the newer ones, I say, it, they just became political trash because they became nothing more than political messaging with makeup on it. 
to pretend to be an entertainment product, which is kind of a detriment to old school conservative films where the messaging was pushed so much so it was second it was before the actual substance or the actual story they just had they had the messaging which i think is why like the old christian films that my parents used to show me you know back in the day they were they were really never really that great you have to have a great story first and you can have morals in it but if it's flipped i feel like it's just trying to cram it down it's not very appealing to a lot of people and that's kind of how the later Futuramas were, unfortunately, in my opinion. Now, Simpsons, of course, is as relevant as VHS is, and what else is it relevant these days? Books? I mean, I buy a bunch of books. It's half my office is a shelf. But I know the average person doesn't like paper books, and I'm just old so like that. But nevertheless, The Simpsons, I didn't realize this, they're on season 35. And I think one of the reasons they're all boring as all hell is, unlike South Park, they really didn't adapt much. It was just the same thing again and again and again. You know, just copy paste all the characters. There really wasn't a lot of changes to the characters. They didn't develop the characters. They, for a long time, I don't think the Simpsons really embraced covering relevant, timely topics, which I think is why South Park is so phenomenally impressive because not only do they, one, they make fun of everyone near equally, which I think that's how comedy is best. Um, and it's just one of those things where they also reference a lot of the direct culture things that go on in our lives today, which makes it more relevant. So that's how I think South Park throughout the years has become more and more of a hit, while Simpsons has become more and more stale. And anecdotally speaking, when I talk to my friends, I don't know a single person who still tunes into The Simpsons. When I was a kid, you know, back in the day, I remember it was a big thing. Every, I think it was like 4 p.m., you'd tune in to Fox to watch The Simpsons, which is perhaps one of the three good things Fox ever did in terms of successful media picks. But... It was a huge controversy just when they moved it from like 4 to 5 p.m. when I was a kid or something like that. Like, all my friends were freaking out. It used to be a huge cultural significance. Now, I mean, I don't know anyone who watches it. But nevertheless, now, they noted in season 35, this is the third episode, apparently Homer says he's changed his while visiting a new neighbor with his wife Marge. When Homer introduced himself with a handshake to the new neighbor, Thayer notes that Homer's got a firm grip. And Homer says, quote, See, Marge, strangling the boy paid off, unquote. And then Homer says in the episode called McManson and Wife, he then adds saying, quote, just kidding. I don't do that anymore. Times have changed, unquote. Which is the dumbest thing because that's not something Homer would ever say. I mean, I know that I'm, perhaps they're attempting to have a futile character arc or a character change, but... It's been, thir what, 34 seasons of nothingness? And when you think about the character Homer, who is a lazy drunk, only slightly more productive to society than Barney in the show, I mean, it, would he ever concede to that? And then, of course, they got roasted on social media. Let's see here. Actually, click on the post. Now, I wonder what the breakdown of the roast will be. Will you have diehard fans who want the gag to keep going? Will you have more, as this has become a political issue, although I don't think it should be, entertainment. Cartoon's a cartoon, but nevertheless, actually, we could play their terrible voices now. Oh, let's see what they sound like, actually. Oh, that's quite a grip. See, Marge, strangling the boy has paid off. Just kidding, I don't do that anymore. Times have changed. It... <laughs> Even his body language and just the way he says it doesn't sound like the thing I grew up with. Like, so bizarre. Nevertheless, that got 400,000 views and 4,000 people did like it. Although you know this person's political affiliation because the original person who posted it said, quote, I just found out that after 30 years, the Simpsons had finally retired their longest running gag on Homer Strangling Bart, took them long enough LMFAO, and like a true mentally vacuous, morally vacuous tyrant, he disabled the comments unless you, let's see, unless he follows or mentions you. Which is a sure sign of a tyrant or someone who is evil, someone who believes in censorship. Which is why my comment section is always open. Even when people have critical comments. I actually appreciate them because that's how I think you grow the most. Granted, some of them are just straight insults. But nevertheless, I believe in free speech so that I've never censored them. Ironically, the only time my videos have ever been censored in terms of the comments being disabled is when I made a specific video on YouTube censoring comments, 
The second one was I, I was talking about Bud Light censoring comments on uh, not Instagram on the Twitter, and the third time was another Bud Light incident where I was talking about the Bud Light business blunder of the century where they hired Dylan Mulvaney for their brand ambassador. By default, I allow all comments, which sometimes to the detriment doesn't make me look good in some regards, but nevertheless, I'm of the old soul and old American opinion where I may not agree with what you're saying, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. Now, going over to the comics section, someone named Sebastian Ortiz says, quote, I knew my man Homer was going to learn he's a smart fella, unquote. He had 329 likes. But, again, he's not smart. He's, I mean, the whole sh part of the shtick in the show is that he's dumb. All right, Simon says, quote, took him 36 years, but he finally learned it. Getting 265 likes. Let's see here. Scrolling past all the memes. Someone named Simon says, quote, not exactly true. That episode touched on the issues of Homer strangling the bark gag. Still continued until season 31. Ah, me. Let's see here. I mean, a lot of people are mentioning that it's clear child abuse, which, of course, is never... I don't think anyone is saying it's ever appropriate to ever... Sh you, uh, like, that's part of the reason it was such a gag was because it was so morally abhorrent because no one of... No one would moral or same value would ever choke a child. That's... That's why it was a gag, I think, is because it was so out there, so to say. Like... Let's see here. Jose Bernal said, quote, To be fair, that was under Disney since they wanted a family-friendly branding for The Simpsons, unquote. Getting 43 likes. Although I can't help but think maybe there's a parallel to the NHL when the hockey tried to become more family friendly by game, removing the fights. Which, I don't know who wants to tune in and see that. But nevertheless, that was a futile attempt for them to win the family market. Matthew Tanson said, quote, Why would they stop doing it? Homer Strangling Bart is one of the, one of the founding gags. It was never premeditated, always an, a snap decision based on how angry Bart makes Homer. Plus, Bart has no right to be upset at Homer for it because Bart does things that intentionally set Homer off. Makes no sense. Unquote. Getting 48 likes. Let's see. Brain fart. He did not say intentionally. Bart does think the things that set Homer off. Let's see here. A lot of people saying, I'm so sad I'll never see this again. And they're doing the memes. Vexen said, quite, uh, quote, wait, why they changed that? I mean, it's a joke, LOL, getting 21 likes. Eskimo Fett Redicum said, quote, really got rid of an iconic gag from The Simpsons. Now I'm glad I did stop watching their newer content in 2016, getting 28 likes. Let's see here. A lot of people say, Rebop. Rance says, quote, I can smell the series finale from here, unquote, getting five likes. Which again, it's one of those things where it's been a long time coming. Decades, in fact, literally. Mr. Monopoly saying, quote, it's an iconic gag. They just can't get rid of it, getting three likes. And I can't help but see the parallel between them and them when they try to cancel themselves for Apu's voice, where one of the best characters in the show that a lot of people say encapsulated the American dream was Apu. He came to the United States, he started a family, he, start, he started his own business with a store, had kids, raised them with values, and it turned out one of the original voice actors was white and he was voicing Apu, who is Indian. So they decided to cancel themselves for that. Which again, when you start a business, especially a cartoon, you have a shoestring budget. That's why a lot of the cartoons you know and love, you have the same voice actor doing dozens of roles. I mean, Rick and Morty, Justin, I think Justin did like ha more than half the voices. So it's one of those things where that was another point of contention for a lot of the Simpsons community, of the 18 people who still watch The Simpsons. They're really upset because they got rid of the character. One of the most morally upstanding characters on the show 
they got rid of him because the voice actor, just because of the race, which is ridiculous beyond all belief. So it'll be interesting to see of the 18 people who still watch The Simpsons, is this going to be a deal breaker where they don't want, I mean, they're, they're just going to miss the gag or they're just going to see this as becoming more and more culturally and politically biased. Uh, if, if this is, I suppose you have one side does believe more in freedom of speech and comedy than the other, but let me know in the comments. Is this going to be a point of contention where you no longer tune into The Simpsons? I mean, where else will you, I mean, I guess next they'll say, oh no, Homer can't say dough anymore because it's pejorative to people who, people, it's very pejorative to people who are gluten intolerant. I mean, dough can be interpreted as the real dough and can't have that. Gluten's evil, I'm told. There, it'll be interesting to see. Time shall tell. Now, going over to the political part of the podcast, you have Vivek revealing, quote, no to neocons, unquote, pledge ahead of the debate. And that gets him about, this is going to his Twitter, and Vivek says, quote, stop World War III, go to no neocons.com. Or no, my grammar's terrible today, apologies. Not one, no, 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 it's no to neocons. The spacing is awful, but nevertheless, yeah, it's supposed to say no to neocons pledge. Now, his pledge specifically says, quote, in order to be considered for a position within the Ramasamy administration, every prospective political appointee must commit and sign the pledge. One, avoid World War III is a vital national objective. Two, war is never a preference, only a necessity. Three, a sole duty of the U.S. policymakers is to the U.S. citizens, unquote. So those are the top three things. If you want to join his campaign, you must commit to. And this is going to be a huge differentiator in the political community. And it is a very unique move on the political just board, some might say. Because a lot of the opponents, as he's fighting to become the Republican nominee, they're much more pro-war. I think Nikki Haley is differentiating herself, wanting to be one of the most active in the which, how many conflicts is the U.S. involved in these days? Or perhaps the better question is, how many do we know about? But nevertheless, she is very much pro-supporting Israel by increasing the U.S. physical. When I say physical, I mean uh, bodies on ground involvement in addition to fiscal cash involvement, which I believe most of the candidates are in favor of fiscally assisting the country because they are an ally. I think Vivek is being more conservative with his wording in that regard. He's saying that we should help them be able to stand on their own, which you could interpret by saying, you know, give them a little bit less money every year, but it is very different than most of the other Republican nominees where they are very much traditionally in favor of supporting those types of conflicts and wars. Although interestingly enough, from a legal perspective where the U.S. in terms of, I mean, we haven't officially declared war in decades. We have many conflicts though. So I wonder, given the people who already support Vivek, I think, We'll probably be mostly supportive comments, but let's dive in and find out. So again, Vivek got about 138,000 views and 853 likes. So it's not one of his most popular posts on Twitter, to be sure, or it's 15 people call it X. Now, let's look at the top comments here. Someone by the name of The Great One says, quote, Vivek, you, you alone can achieve this, and you must. You must win this GOP nomination, and you will, for God is real, and God has a plan, unquote. Got 20 likes. Someone by the name of Vera Group, who, perhaps that's his name, but he does not get an F for marketing because he has a cool vintage Camaro as a profile picture. C minus. Nevertheless, Mr. Vero Gap says, quote, no one on cons, unquote. Spelling and grammar be damned. But nevertheless, they did get 27 likes as one of the top comments. Let's see here. Someone by the name of B. Valix says, quote, this is where you get a free toaster after the timeshare presentation, unquote, getting seven likes. Someone did a move, Mr. Move to NH has a picture of Wolverine in bed. It says me. And he's reminiscing on a picture, and the picture's been photoshopped to say, not being on the brink of World War III, getting 14 likes. Which, yes, I think a lot of people are worried about that. So, interestingly enough... Uh, 
I'd say about 50-50 split. TV says, quote, the only anti-war candidate, both Haley and DeSantis, will fund both Ukraine and Israel. Insane. Getting eight likes. So interestingly enough, even though I don't think, well, statistically speaking, this is certainly not one of his most popular posts on Twitter. I think because it's so different than the other prospective Republican nominee candidates, this will be something to highlight in the debate. And for the people who are casting their ballots, I think that will be a differentiator that could help him or hurt him. It'll be interesting to see how many people, where there, uh, how many people go one way or the other, and if it is a net positive for his campaign, or perhaps will it actually have the opposite effect and actually hurt his campaign? He'll go down in the polls. Be fascinating to see. But as I always say, time shall tell. Other interesting political news: You have Ron DeSantis gets the Iowa governor endorsement, but the comments are still. Mostly negative. Now, this, of course, is on Twitter, or as 18 people call it, X. Let me know in the comments. Do you know anyone in your social circle who actually calls Twitter X? I can't help but think, no, probably not. Now, Ron DeSantis specifically says, quote, It is an honor to be endorsed by Iowa's greatest senator, hashtag Kim Reynolds, Iowa. Kim has led her state with strength and principle and delivered big results. She knows how to win the tough fights needed to get things done. Together, we will win Iowa. And this video got 349,000 views and 6.4 thousand likes. And I'll play the first couple minutes of her speaking really quick. We can turn this country around, but if we don't get this next election right, if we don't choose right, we are not going to get this country back. So we have to do everything we can to make the right choice. Not only do we need to make sure that we elect someone who can win and beat Joe Biden, we... Oh, that's that. So we have to do everything we can to make the right choice. Not only do we need to make sure that we elect someone who can win and beat Joe Biden, we need a president who has the skill and the resolve to reverse the madness that we see every single day. We need someone who will fight for you and win for you. We need someone who won't get distracted but will stay disciplined, who puts this country first and not himself. It's a very exuberant, bombastic, happy crowd, and it is a very vital state. Even when I was in Iowa back then, you know, back in the day, as some might say, it was mostly mostly a purple state, partially because of the big college town of Iowa City, which is famously, of course, where the University of Iowa is headquartered and based. Although I would say they are not based, as youth might call them, but nevertheless, it is a vital swing state. It's gone back and forth between Republican and Democrat for many years. And he'll play a vital role. And again, this is interesting enough. She's you know putting her support here. But we also have multiple polls now showing that Trump is winning in five of the six swing states. And in terms of the preliminary polls, asking people, you know, would they support DeSantis or Biden? So it'll be interesting to see. Let's jump down in the comments and see how many are positive. Let's see here. Paul DeCispa says, quote, Trump is ahead of DeSantis by 40 points. The people have already spoken. They've chosen Trump, unquote. Person got 207 likes. Mike Kalimda says, quote, 870 live viewers for an announcement nobody cares about. Drop out Rob, unquote. Getting 136 likes. COD says, quote, you can't beat Trump, period. End of discussion. Take care of Florida, unquote. Getting 246 likes. There are many memes of DeSantis in boots, which is a controversy in and of itself. Let's see. MAGA American, who, A plus for marketing, their profile picture of a, is a MAGA of American, so I mean, you know exactly what they are. Now, MAGA American says, quote, Trump 2024 is right, getting 40 likes. Mm, 
this person also says they tweeted Trump is the only person that cares about we the people, not fat cat corporate dollars. Can he, that got 50 likes. Interesting. Oh, no way. Louise Simpson says, quote, two coward turncoats that bit the hand that fed them Trump. Trump 2024 getting 39 likes. Burt Macklin says, quote, all DeSantis does is win, getting 64 likes, which is the first positive comment. Although, right below him, Thomas Payne Band says, quote, DeSantis dishonored all of his Florida voters, getting 84 likes. Although Sean Phillips, this person just said, quote, just to donate to Ron DeSantis, unquote, getting 41 likes. Gemma L says, quote, she's as boring, wow, she's as boring him, getting 77 likes. Uh, Queen of Donuts. Says, quote, great speech. Kim Reynolds picked a great winner, getting 16 likes. Adorable Deplorable says, quote, what you did tonight was despicable, unquote, getting 40, 27 likes. Mad Bull American says, quote, some women are just in a third place, guys, unquote, getting 76 likes. So he did get a couple positive comments, but as usual, most of them are viscerally against him. There are a couple of supportive of her in these comments. But overall, as youth might say, DeSantis was ratioed. Though again, it'll be interesting to see what does this do to his poll numbers. Could this be something that helps him reverse the trend where he started at about 35% went down to cratering to about 14%? And again, those are aggregator numbers, so it's the averages of all the polls. So it'll be interesting to see. Let me know in the comments, do you think this will have a positive impact on his campaign or negative? Interesting to see, but time shall tell. Other interesting, or rather going down to the business blunder of the day, you have GM to halt production of the cruise driverless SUV van thingamajig. Now, they said they've put a temporary halt in this thanks to Reuters of its fully autonomous cruise origin van days before the unit said it was pausing all driverless operations. First reported by Forbes, citing an, au an audio of cruise CEO Kyle Vogt's address in an all-hands meeting. Vogt, according to the Forbes, told staff during the meeting that the company had produced hundreds of origin vehicles already and that it has, quote, more than enough for near term when we were to ramp things back up. They also claim that they're going to continue production, but crews in February 2022 petitioned U.S. regulators seeking permission to deploy 2,500 self-driving origin vehicles annually without human controls like steering wheels. And it looks like they're still waiting for the Final here back. Now, Cruz, the issue with them right now, business blunder continues to be, well, it kind of ran over a pedestrian, which, again, is uh, not great for driverless vehicles, especially ones that don't have things like steering wheels and brakes, where if there is an issue, you can't override that issue or intervene. And also, great for hackers, because, again, just it boggles my mind how many people will willingly give up their freedom to an autonomous vehicle they cannot control. But nevertheless, they had an issue where one of their vehicles ran over someone, and that kind of put the brakes on their initiatives as well, pun moderately intended with the brakes, although the brakes really didn't work in that situation. So a pun on multiple levels, some might say. Now, the cruise's board directors hired a law firm by the name of Emmanuel, or Quinn Emanuel to review the cruise management response to regulators' October 2nd investigation and technology consulting exponent to review the cruise's technology. So again, not great for a company that wants to go all EV and all autonomous. So it'll be interesting to see, would you ever trust one of those vehicles? I mean, I wouldn't, but the fact that they're having all these issues and all of these, it's just a detriment to the technology adoption and the business in general is precarious to say the least, that's gotta be the business part of the day. Thank you, everyone, for, again, for taking time to tune in today, trying to get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of November. So if you can click that button, I'd greatly appreciate it. Also, leaving a comment is a great way to help me know what I need to improve on in terms of slowing down my rate of speech, as well as working my enunciation and decreasing my stuttering. Again, clicking the button may very well cure those things. It'll be interesting to see, but time shall tell. And lastly, don't forget to take time to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe, fight good fight.